All right, well, let me start by just asking, like, and again, y'all are welcome to participate or just stare at me. Either one I'm completely fine with, but what words, what adjectives, what things come to mind if I were to ask you, like, how would you describe, like, what is a man? Leader. Leader? It's a good one to come with. All right, all right, that's fair. I'm sorry? Provider, Provider? all right. Well, after crawling through Google and other uh, websites and all kinds of things, uh, I didn't really want to look for like an official, like here are the top 10 because like what makes official official? So all I did was again, I went through four, five, six different websites and I just found like these were the common themes, common words that I saw most often. Um, in this case, again, there's no particular order because like I said, I'm just kind of going through whatever ones that I found, like this one happened to be in like three of the four, this one happened to be in you know, five of the six, whatever it is. So the first one that everybody mentioned uh, as just descriptive words of a man is courageous, assertive, reliable, loyal, and strong. Those are the five that I at least found every single time. I always found those five words through most of the websites in how to describe a man. And see, when it comes to like movie and cultures and things of that nature, the stereotypical man kind of comes off as like the, the James Bond kind of person, whoever emulates that in the time being, you know, whoever's filling that in. Is it still Daniel something? I forget his name, right? Is he still current James Bond? I don't know if we've come on to a new one, but yeah, that would be kind of your, your stereotypical, like that's your man, man. If you want to go old school, you could talk about Clint Eastwood and the uh, cowboy uh, era and kind of things. Or if you say family enough times, perhaps you can say Dom from Fast and the Furious, but whatever you want to go with. That stereotypical macho man is kind of what the, the movie industry would kind of argue. That's, that's who our society deems is a man. But more recently, I feel like the term behind, and the idea rather, behind manliness has taken quite the shift. What it means to be a man, what it means to act out masculinity, and oftentimes what it means to, to be a traditional man is kind of seen more negatively. Right, that our history has always kind of held us one standard, but more recently, everything just says that's not quite right. And we've kind of developed this term now that's kind of known as toxic masculinity, right? That if you act a certain way, if you are certain masculine traits and you hold to those things, you're not just being a man, you're being a toxic man, essentially. And it's that term that I want to dive into here this morning. We're continuing our series, the first one for the new year at least, uh, this one called Jesus versus the World. We've been looking at these different ideas, these different concepts, um, these different themes, whatever it may be, these, these ideas that the world advocates for, that our culture would say, this is how things should be, and we're comparing them to what does Jesus and what does the Bible ultimately say it should actually be as. And again, if you were with us last week, we looked at this idea of, well, should somebody be more of a girl boss or should somebody be more of a trad wife, traditional wife, as it would be known as? And we kind of came to the answer that it's, it's a little bit of both, actually, right? When you look at the Proverbs 31, you kind of see this example of a woman laid out before us who, who often at times did traditional wife things, that she sewed, that she cooked food, that she prepared things for her family. And at the very same time, she was very girl boss-ish, girl boss -ish, that she dealt in high-end fabric, so that it wasn't just regular things, but it was things dealt for, for royalty and people with prestige, that she went out and she bought land and she produced grapes and vineyards and, and and wines and all kinds of things like that. But regardless of where you land on, and really for man or for woman, what we saw was in verse 30, that's what we have to land at, right? That regardless of man or woman, that it's somebody who fears the Lord that needs to be valued. And so here, I want to dive into this week again. What is a toxic man? What does the world say is a toxic man? And then on the other side of it, what does the Bible say makes a biblical man? What does biblical manliness look like? And so far, as I've always done, I've defined the word based on the society kind of first, and then I'll look at how, again, Jesus responds to it. And so again, once, once again, scrolling through social media and all these other things, you often hear and see this phrase uh, in a lot of different like shorts, TikToks, and things like that. You see it kind of come up, and again, I don't mean offense by this, but I think this is how they would generally define themselves as somebody who's, who's more woke, who would it be a person uh, choosing this lifestyle, choosing um, this area where they want to say that they're more progressive, right? And they'll argue that, that choosing this isn't really like the wrong way, but this is the way, this is the future of things to kind of come. And more importantly, again, they'll argue that any of the traditional manliness, any of the things that, that the past they held to, anything that really advocates for a lifestyle against theirs, 
that will be toxic masculinity. And I've given a couple examples, or I'll, I'll live, give a couple examples here. Um, I found that just watching through the videos, um, yeah, just kind of, yeah, have fun if you want to scroll through what toxic masculinity looks like in, in terms of that. But uh, three things that I found uh, of different examples. One said that toxic masculinity is believing that there are only two genders. That this man came and said, I think there's only man and woman. And she's like, that's toxic masculinity behavior right there. Right? That's how she labeled toxic masculinity. Another person said that she thought that it was very toxic of this man, that he felt that men couldn't wear dresses, that it wasn't appropriate for men to wear dresses. That was apparently very toxic behavior on his side of things. And this one, the most interesting for me as I read through it, that a person, a man specifically, was called homophobic and again, showing toxic masculinity when he said that he would not date a trans woman. That that was something he would not do and they were like, that's toxic behavior. When if you think about what those terms actually mean and what this guy is advocating for, it doesn't seem that crazy to me. I don't know, we can talk about it later in Sunday school if you want, but that seems like the more obvious answer. But that's just kind of me. But nonetheless, these are some of the examples that I found in our current culture of toxic masculinity, essentially really denying that there's masculine and feminine, that there's man and woman, that really these, these areas are blurred, that there's a gray area in between these things. And so culturally, defining toxic masculinity, I feel, again, it's kind of, it's kind of nuts. It's, it's, I feel like a weapon used more against whether it be conservative men, whether it be traditional men, whether it be whatever phrase you want to look at here, it's used to weaponize the liberal movement of this is what the progressive side says that womanhood and manhood should look like. And if you disagree with that, then you're now being a toxic man, essentially. Now, for a more formal definition, actually, uh, in comparison to what we went through last week of girl boss and tried wife, those are more colloquial terms. You will just find them used on the street. You can't open Webster's and, and see that. But oddly enough, WebMD actually has a page defining toxic masculinity. So I was like, let's go into a more formal. I don't want to say WebMD is your end-all, be-all. Again, you search your symptoms, and suddenly you find out, I have cancer in like my entire body just because I have sniffles, you know, whatever it may be. So take that with a grain of salt. But WebMD defines toxic masculinity as a set of social guidelines stereotypically associated with manliness that often have negative impacts on men, women, and society in general. So that's their definition, right? A set of societal guidelines that impacts men, women, and society negatively. But to WebMD's credit, and I, I, like I said, I'll give them credit where it is, they did say that masculinity itself isn't bad. Right, that being masculine is not necessarily negative, but it's certain behaviors and certain ways of thinking that can be negative, right? That, that toxic doesn't always have to be paired with masculinity, which again, I, I think is what the, the more woke side of things. Everything is always paired together. To, to, to be masculine, it, masculine is to be toxic, whereas WebMD again just defines it as you can have toxic masculinity and you can have people who are just masculine. Those are two separate things. But there are examples of toxic masculinity would be promiscuity. Right, they're saying that they would praise men for having multiple partners, while at the same time those same men would express disgust at women for having multiple partners. So this uh, hypocritical behavior. I would just argue it's better to not have multiple partners, regardless of what gender you are. But that's just kind of my thought process. The other thing they mentioned was that uh, toxic masculinity it revolves around stoicism. Right, that if you're mentally and physically tough. That's, that's the role of the man, that you're not supposed to show emotion, you're not supposed to cry, you're not supposed to do those things, that as a man you're supposed to be stoic, just stone-faced, everything is, is serious, and, and we're good to go here, right? The last one that I, at least I agree with is violence, right? That toxic masculinity sees violence as the answer to assert dominance and to solve their problems, that violence is the first step to solve things. And so again, like I said, overall, I completely disagree with WebMD. I might phrase things a little bit differently or put more emphasis and less emphasis on certain things, but that's how they're defining it. That's what they're saying toxic masculinity is. But at the end of the day, I think when it comes to toxic masculinity, I think toxic masculinity thrives when biblical manhood fails. When we as men choose not to act as how God has made us, how God has created us, how God has instructed us to be. When we fail to do what God has told us, that's when toxic masculinity rises. So with all of that, let's turn to what Jesus says. Let's turn to what the Bible says about what biblical manhood should look like. And we're going to cover several different passages. So if you have your phones or your Bibles, you can practice turning and, and, and practicing your skills of navigating through your Bible. But of course, we'll have them up here on the screens as well. So first, I'm going to turn us to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. And it reads for us here. 
Now we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness and not in accordance with the tradition that you received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us, because we were not idle when we were with you, nor do we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with toil and labor, we worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. It was not because we do not have that right, but to give you, a, but to give you in ourselves an example to imitate. For even when we were with you, we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. So I think the first thing that describes biblical manhood, the first thing that describes uh, a Bible-believing man, essentially, is that this person has to work. Right? The Paul is writing here that the church in Thessalonica, he's, he's writing mainly to encourage them, but he's also writing to kind of make some corrections to, to their faithfulness and, and to the way that they believe in things here. And here in chapter 3, he tells them that, hey, you as men, you as people, you need to work. And he starts in verse 3. I'll go back a little bit here. He starts in verse uh, 6. I'm sorry, chapter, six verse, or chapter 3, verse 6. He starts in the very beginning here. And he says, to avoid anybody, to stay away from anybody who walks in idleness. Right? He's basically saying, anybody who's lazy, stay away from those who are lazy. And he gives, him, and he gives us, rather, the best counterexample that he mentions himself. He talks of how, when I was with you, when I was there serving at the church in Thessalonica, when I was there working with you, I did not eat anybody's bread without paying for it. I did not do things without working for them. In fact, he even says, and he continues, that he worked day and night so as not to be a burden to anyone. He did all of this so that he would be an example for them to follow, that they would imitate Paul as Paul imitates Christ. At the very end of verse 10, Paul says that if anyone is not willing to work, don't let them eat. That the biblical man is one who works. That, that Paul advocating for this isn't being Paul, uh, Paul isn't being vindictive or he isn't being just spiteful or he isn't just trying to, to make things harder on people. But he's giving practical, spiritual, loving advice. Because when people, the church particularly during this time and even to this time, when we support somebody who's lazy... It means that the church can't support somebody who actually needs it. When you support somebody who can do something and chooses not to do something, it means that you can't help somebody who can't do something and needs that help. See, so again, working has always been a good thing. It's when you don't work that you create this attitude, this environment of entitlement. It creates this culture of laziness. It ultimately creates toxic masculinity. And again, like I said, working has always been a good thing. When you go all the way back to Genesis 2, when God created Adam, when he created man, he put man to work in the garden. And it wasn't until chapter 3, when we fell, when we sinned against God, that we see our attitude towards work change. No longer was work a good thing for us, but it was something that stressed us and caused us to sweat and caused us issues because of how we sinned against God. So work has and always will be a good thing. It's our view in light of sin that we now see work as a bad thing. So a biblical man starts off here as one who works. The second thing I'll get into here comes from John chapter 11. Two words, Jesus wept. Versus Jesus wept. And the common joke when it comes to this verse is that this is the shortest verse in the Bible, which it is. And so if you ever need to quote it like, hey, can you give me a Bible verse? Just say, Jesus wept and you'll be good. That's all you need to know, right? But even in just these two words, there's a lot of context behind it. There's a lot of meaning that comes out when you look into what this really means. But what I think this shows us in our journey about biblical manhood is that men can have emotions. Right, that it is okay for a man to cry. As mentioned from the definition from WebMD, stoicism, or again, this lack of emotion, is this trait of toxic masculinity. I think here, Jesus completely pushes back on this idea that it's okay for a man to cry. See, so here in chapter 11, Jesus had been teaching, and he's going around to the lands, and he's continuing just to impact the land and show them what it means to, to follow after God, to chase after God, to devote their lives to God. And this person comes to Jesus and he's like, hey, your friend Lazarus is really sick. Like, he really needs you to get over there. 
And Jesus is like, okay, let's start going over there. But he, he takes his time. He doesn't drop everything and just starts running over to, to see Lazarus. He takes his time. And by the time that he arrives in Bethany, he arrives where Lazarus is at. Lazarus has been dead for four days. And ultimately, when Jesus comes in, he sees everybody. He's talking to Martha. He's dealing with everything. And when he comes to see Lazarus, he sees Mary, and she is crying. She is weeping. And she says to Jesus, like, if, if you had just been here, like, our brother Lazarus would not have died. And she is just crying. And Jesus seeing this, and Jesus seeing Mary, he cries with her. Like, Jesus, Jesus could have been like, what are you crying for? Like, I'm here. I can fix this. I'm going to fix this. I know that I'm going to fix this. But even then, Jesus seeing everything happen, Jesus seeing the emotional pain. I didn't want to say damage because I'm not going to quote that guy. Even seeing through the emotional pain that she's going through, he still takes the time to say, I can empathize with you. I can feel the pain that you're going through. I can feel the hurt that you're feeling. And even though I know that I'm about to make everything right by bringing this guy back from the dead, I will weep with you. And I think that tells us one thing, just from a, a theological standpoint. Whenever you're in pain, whenever you're dealing with something, you're just like, does God even care? Does God listen? This tells you, yes, that Jesus wept, that Jesus cried, that Jesus felt the pain that she was feeling. He felt the hurt that she was feeling. Even though he knew he was going to make everything better, he still felt that pain with her. But again, coming back to biblical manliness, seeing Jesus cry here tells us, again, it is okay for men to cry. It is okay for men to empathize and to weep. And if you think that men don't cry, it's not even just Jesus. It goes all the way back to the Old Testament. King David, when he heard that his son Absalom had died, he cried. And you might think, like, well, of course, it's his son. Of course he cried. Keep in mind that Absalom is the man who slept with King David's concubines, again, a.k.a. Wives, for lack of a better term. I'll, I'll go with that just to simplify things, right? This is his son who slept with King David's wives. And in the moment, the moment that this is happening, he is plotting, planning, and trying to figure out and attacking, trying to kill David in order to take the throne. And when David hears that this son, the son who has slept with his concubines, the son who is trying to actively kill him to take the throne that he sits upon, when he hears that his son has died, he cries. He weeps for his son. So regardless of how you may see it, regardless of what you may think of, again, King David was a man who wrote poetry. He played the harp. He wept for his son. But he is still a man. And if you want to disagree, you can argue... But again, you can take it up with the guy who wrestled and won against a lion and a bear. You can argue with the guy who stoned a giant when nobody else would challenge him. You can argue with the guy who went to war for most of his life, leading his armies into battle. You want to argue with that guy, you go ahead. I'm going to say that that guy's still a man. That he can cry, he can weep, just as Jesus wept, and they are still men. So to have emotion, to deal with emotion, makes you a biblical man. Now we'll turn to Ephesians chapter 5. So Ephesians 5, uh, verse 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her by having cleansed her by washing of water with the word. Now you might be wondering, like, did I, did I mean to read 22? Because that addresses the wives, and we're talking to the guys, right? We're supposed to be talking about what is biblical manliness, right? What does biblical manhood look like? Like, I could have talked about this last week when we talked about women and talking about Proverbs, and we could have gone over that it's, it's part of the woman's duty to submit to her husband. But I left this here for a particular reason. I knew that I was coming from what is a woman to coming to what is a man here. And I wanted to leave this here particularly because, men, you need to hear that it's your wife's duty to submit to you. It is not your duty to submit her to you. 
In a sense, wives, you need to hear that as well. Your role is to submit to your husband. It is not your husband's role to submit you to him. And I say this, I put this here, because for far too long in much of our history, people have used this verse as a way to abuse and to control women, when that's never been the point. Again, our duty as a man is not to submit our wife. That is her responsibility and her duty. Our role, as it continues in verse 25, is to love your wife. Paul addresses and he says that their role is to love your wife as Christ loved the church. But moreover, it's not that just Christ loved the church, but Christ gave himself up for her. That as a man, you are to give yourself up for your family. You are to serve your family, not submit your family to you. That while, yes, wives are called to submit to their husbands, husbands are to dedicate themselves for their wives' betterment. And he continues to explain what all this means in verse 26. That he might sanctify her. That his role, that our role as a man is to cover our wives, to care for our wives, to to make them holy, to make them presentable, to make them before God, to look pure and beautiful and blameless. That a biblical man will do everything he can so that his wife can be an amazing woman of God. And her sanctification is done, as it says at the very end here, through the covering, the cleansing, the washing of water, with the word, that through his dedication to studying, to understanding, to teaching the word, that as he learns, as we learn, I speak we as in men, as we learn, we are to take this understanding, our studying of the Bible, our studying of the gospel, our studying of the scriptures, and we are to use that to wash her, to purify her, to sanctify our wives. Now, let me take a little bit of pressure off the guys here for a second. Notice that, again, this is to enhance. Right? That this is not the only way that a woman seeks after God. That a wife's spiritual growth is enhanced by having a biblical man. But it is not dependent upon it. You know, that Paul also gives this advice when it comes to a woman. If a woman is married to a man who is not a believer... Her role is not to divorce him, but her role as a believer, as a follower of Christ, is to pray for, to continue to be and to share the gospel with him in the hopes that as she submits to him, even though he doesn't submit to Christ, that in her following after Christ, her example will lead him to Christ. That is her responsibility, her duty. And so we as men, we are called not to be the only source of inspiration, not to be the only source of her sanctification, but we are to enhance it, to be part of it. And that is our responsibility, is to give up as Christ gave up for the church so that she would be seen by all as blameless, as spotless, particularly in the eyes of God, that he would see our wife as holy, as sanctified, as set apart. So again, it is to serve our wives, not to submit them to us. The last thing that I have for us is in John chapter 10. John chapter 10. I don't know if I... Okay, I did go back. All right. John chapter 10, verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. He who is a hired hand does not... uh, He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. So again, here, Jesus in chapter 10, he is talking to religious leaders. He's talking to the different Pharisees. He's talking to the scribes. He's talking to all the different people here in Jerusalem. And essentially, he's, he's throwing shade at them. He's insulting them to the most nth degree because I don't know how you can do it in the most poetic way that you can. But that's what Jesus does. He insults them because they are not following what they have been preaching. They have been hypocritical in what they've been doing. So if you were a religious leader listening to Jesus, he was saying that, hey, the, the sheep, let me give you three different examples of what's happening here. Jesus is saying, hey, the sheep that are going, they listen to their master's voice. The sheep will listen to their shepherd's voice. And so these people who are following me, they are following me because they are my sheep. And they are listening to what God has commanded. And you Pharisees, you have been pushing against me. You have been rejecting me. You do not listen to my voice. So you must not belong to the flock of God. 
Can you imagine telling that to like different pastors? Can again, like, I, if if that was happening right now, if I were being hypocritical, can you imagine how it would feel for you to come up and tell me, "Hey, even though you hold this position of pastor, you have been hypocritical. You have been living a lie." Like, can you imagine that's the the audacity and the boldness that, that must have taken, and how insulting that must have been for somebody in that position. Yet that's what you would be called to if that's what actually happened. If you find fault, if you find me not above reproach, that's what you would be called to do. So the first analogy that Jesus gives here before he gets to 11, he says, the sheep recognize the shepherd's voice. I am that shepherd. If you do not follow me, you are not my sheep. You belong to another flock. You belong to the devil. And he continues and he gives another analogy. And he says that I am the door. That sheep, when they would come in to sleep into the pen, they would enter through the door. And Jesus is saying, that is me, that I let the sheep through, that no one enters into heaven except through me. And you Pharisees, you scribes who continue to reject me, you are rejecting heaven and you are choosing hell. And so finally he comes to this one. He says, in, in combination of those two things and building off those two things, not only do the sheep recognize my voice, but I as the shepherd, I lay down my life for them. That Jesus is saying, I am the good shepherd, that the sheep who have listened to me, the sheep who have come into the door, who have come through me to enter into sanctification, into salvation, into paradise, that I would sacrifice my life for them. He talks of how if this was just a hired hand, if this is somebody you had just paid for, this is somebody who just came to visit, they're not going to lay down their life. Right? If you are shopping at a mall, you don't think like, this seems like a good opportunity for me to sacrifice my life for these random strangers. No, you're going to do your shopping. If something happens, you're going you're gonna to jet. You're going to get out of there. I was going to use different words, but I should go with that. You're going to leave. You're going to run. But Jesus says that this is my sheep. These are my sheep. These aren't somebody else's sheep. These aren't something that belongs to other people. These are my sheep. And when I see my sheep, I lay down my life for them. All this is to show us that as biblical men, we emulate what Christ has done. That as Christ would sacrifice his life for his flock, for his sheep, we as biblical men are called to sacrifice for our flock. So the question arises of is, who is our flock? I think for me, one thing that I've always appreciated in my seminary education, that the school that I went to, from every speaker to every teacher to every minister, everybody who walked through our doors and taught and told us something, the one theme they always kept together was, you take care of your flock, you take care of your church before you take care of the church. You take care of your flock before you take care of the flock. And so when asking, what does your flock look like? I think you have to look at it in concentric circles. Who are the people most immediate to you? Maybe for you, if you're married, that's going to be your spouse, your husband or your wife and your kids. That's going to be your immediate circle. That, you're, that is your flock that you have been called to care for. If you're single, perhaps that leads to the other example, the other circle that I say for married people that still applies to as well. Maybe that's your immediate family, your mother, your father, your siblings, your nieces, nephews, whoever that lands between. And from there, maybe the circle just continues to grow. Maybe it's your aunts and uncles, your cousins, and that circle just continues to grow. Maybe that's your friends, your, your neighbors, and the people around you, and that circle just continues to grow. The way that you would sacrifice for your inner circle is going to look very different than the way that you would sacrifice for your outer circle. The sacrifice you make for the inner circle would be significantly larger than the sacrifice you make for the outer circle. But we, as biblical men, are called to sacrifice for each and every one, to continue to be the gospel for each and every one, to continue to be the voice that leads people towards Christ. As we imitate Him, as we continue to be shadows of him, we continue to sacrifice ourselves for the people in our flock. And so as we come to a close here this morning, I want to make one distinction about these last two messages. The last week, again, if you were with us, uh, I talked about what, again, what it meant to be a biblical woman, what a Proverbs 31 woman looked like. And then today, again, I talked about what it means to be a biblical man. And if you notice, for, for both of these, I didn't specify like, hey, this Sunday is, is for the women. So if you're a guy, just kind of chill. We'll get you next week and vice versa. Again, I didn't say today is for the men. So women, you 
Wickman. Y'all had your week last week, so y'all get to chill this week. Today is for the men. Now, both of these have been for everybody. Because as women, you know, when you hear what it means to be a biblical woman, you hear of what it means to, to strive for, you see this standard that you're reaching for. And as men, when you read of what Proverbs 31 says and what a woman is to look like and what a wife is to look like, you have an example, you have a model of what your spouse should be chasing after. Does it mean that you'll hit every single one of those perfectly? No. Does it mean that you'll hit everything perfectly here as a biblical man? No. But we know the standard that we're chasing after. And same thing here for men, that when you hear of what a biblical man is, you know what you're striving after. You know the example that Christ has left before us. And you know that you should be looking for. And vice versa for women. When you hear of what a biblical man is, you know what your husband should look like. You know what your future husband should be like. See, if we were to end toxic masculinity, really, if we were to end just toxic behavior, we should all be striving for what God has called us to. If we followed the plan, if we followed the design that God gave for us, rather than what this world would have given to us, rather than the definitions that the world is striving for us to enter into, imagine the message, imagine the, the image of Christ that we could display to those around us. That we could tell people that Christ died on the cross for us. That even though I fail to sometimes be the woman that God has called me to be, that sometimes I fail to be the man that God has called us to be, that it's his sacrifice on the cross that makes up for all of it. That it's his sacrifice on the cross that forgives my sins. That would be the message we could take out to the world. And that's still the message we're called to, even in our faults, even in our failures. We are called to take this gospel, to be this gospel, and to share this gospel. Imagine a world like that. Imagine a world filled with people doing that each and every day. And imagine what stops you from doing that each and every day. What stops you from being the gospel to each and every person you interact with. Okay, I think that continues to be the goal for each of us as biblical men and as biblical women. As people chasing after what God has established for us. As trying to become more and more like Christ and less and less like ourselves be these characteristics of a biblical man, to be these characteristics of a biblical woman, and again, just to continue to be shadows of Christ. So with that, my hope and prayer is that you would come to be that. If you don't know him, if you haven't made a relationship with him, if you haven't made a commitment to him, then we welcome you to enter into that as well. If you have questions about that, we'd love nothing more than here at West Houston just to walk you through what a life like that looks like, why you should even devote yourself to him. If you have questions, if you have things that are on your mind, feel free to bring them. Again, God hasn't seen a question, heard a question that he has not answered. I may have. I might not have an answer. And I can tell you I'll look for it. But God knows it. God wills it. And God wants a relationship with you. He is holding back judgment so that you can have an opportunity to repent. So let us continue to be people who emulate Christ, to reach the gospel, to share the gospel. And let us continue just to be people who emulate Christ in our husbands, in our wives, in the people we interact with and our flocks and our circles around us. So with that, let me pray for us and we'll respond in song here. Father, again, we thank you for this time. We thank you for this opportunity that we can just gather and that we can continue to learn of more of what it means to be biblical women, biblical men. And God, we just pray that as we go through, would you continue to help us, give us the strength and energy to do what we cannot. That we would have the strength to be reflections, to be examples of Christ with those we work with, with those we interact with, with those that we speak with. Continues to let us be countercultural, to do not what the culture says is right, what the culture deems is acceptable, but to continue to be people who go after your standard, who go after your design. So God, we pray that you would just continue to help us, continue to strengthen us, continue to provide your Holy Spirit. And we have nothing else to depend on, nothing else to hold on to. We know that we can hold fast to you. And again, God, let us come with questions. Let us come seeking you. I know that you continue to answer. You continue to be everything we need. We do these, pray these, all in Jesus' name. Amen.